It's Around the Paul, and welcome to this week's episode. I'm Garrett Mitchell, along with Griffin Barfield and Clifton Kennedy. And we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to go back and regrettably revisit the Florida State game from last week. And we're going to relive the pain and torture ourselves all over again. And then we're going to talk about this week's matchup as the Tigers travel north to New York State. And they will take on the Syracuse Orange. And so we've got a lot to get to. We're just going to jump right into this week's show. And uh, really, the biggest question on everybody's mind is, what in the hell did we just watch on Saturday? I, I mean, you could ask me. I mean, I could ask you the same question, right? I was, you know, I was a fan for that game. It was the first game that I went to as a fan. I was, like, front row. Um, one, of, I was by one of the Enzo's. I was on the one opposite of the one where um, Jonathan Whites missed the 29-yard kick. But it, it's the story of the season. Clemson imploded, right? And, you know, the only team that they've beaten now all year. And there's not a lot you can do about it. And... I, you know, it had me scratching my head towards the end of it. You know, some play calling issues, some, you know, special teams that we thought might have been resolved were missed, were missed. You know, turnovers kind of changed the whole tide of the game. So at the end of the day, it's it's just kind of you're it's a head scratcher, right? So, you know, it if it gives me any positive outlook, I am much more confident with this team, um, which we'll get to later. But, you know, from first impressions, you know, like – as soon as Florida State scored in overtime, I was like, yeah, we are. there's no way that we're winning this game. We're going to find some way to mess this up and lose this game. And Clifton, for as much yeah. that went right on Saturday, and there was a lot that went right. And, again, we're going to talk about that. What went wrong? What went wrong uh, for Clemson and in a game that they so thoroughly whipped Florida State? And make no mistake, Clemson whipped Florida State up and down the stat sheet. Seminoles rushed for 22 yards. Uh, Clemson over 100 yards rushing. Cade Klubnick with his probably his best uh, wire-to-wire start as a Clemson Tiger. A lot of things went right, but at the end of the day, you still find a way to lose that game. So what went wrong? Yeah, I mean, I think Clemson's three plays in that game. There's three plays in that game that – well, there's a lot more that you could point to, but I think you can point to three plays that – how Clemson got beat. The first one was the fumble. The second one, um, maybe there was just two that I'm thinking about. The second one was when um, Wiggins got hurt because, and then, the, oh, there is three. And then the third play is that touchdown because they picked on Wiggins' as backup. And yeah. um, if if Wiggins would have been there, he would not have caught that ball. There's no way in heck he catches that ball. Because every time they threw to Wiggins, I, they didn't they didn't catch the ball. The person that he was guarding did not catch the ball, and or covering did not catch the ball. And it it comes down to those three plays, I think. And you know that fumble. <clears throat> if if Mafa comes up and you know just stays in a three seconds longer, he picks up that block, and we go up fourteen. And they don't even have it's a over. chance in hell. It's over. That it's over. Score it's game. over in the third. Yeah, Two it's score over game. in the third quarter. And you know, so that's been our seat. Like you said, that's our season all year. Like um, we're three plays away from being undefeated, and in the top five, really. <laughs> if you think about it, right? And you know, it was. It's just to a point. It adds up to a to a comedy. It's a comedy of errors and bad luck or anything else that you want to call it. But let's talk about the game management. And, it, you know, some may hesitate to uh, to criticize uh, Dabo Swinney or Garrett Riley or whatever the case may be. But I think that, and to a degree, it's probably warranted after this ball game because there were really just some head-scratching decisions. And it starts with the usage of timeouts in, in the fourth quarter, knowing that they could be critical – these timeouts, the last two timeouts were just burned for no reason. It, it was totally inconsequential the times that they were taken. And then lo and behold, Tigers get a stop, get the ball back at their own 39-yard line with 12 seconds to play, and then the lack of timeouts is compounded, at least to me, 
by the utter lack of willingness to try to take a shot. You're at the 39 yard line. If we've, if we're to believe everything that's been said, Robert Gunn has leg from 60 yards, maybe more. He may not have made a 50, 60 yard kick. I'm not saying that he would. I don't know that anybody would, but at least try, at least try. You needed 25 yards for a 54 yard kick, 25 yards. You can get three plays out of 12 seconds if you play it right. Get 12 yards of pop over two plays. At least try to go to the sideline. Get him within fringe field goal range and then just let him kick it. At that point, what do you have to lose? And to me, that it was just complete and utter mismanagement on the coach's part. And Griffin, to me, it was inexcusable. 100%. And, you know, you're not going to be the number four team in the country by playing it safe. You have to roll the dice at some point. And towards the end of the game, you know, when they had, you know, the limited amount of time and, you know, they even ran it up the middle of Shipley. He, I think he did pick up a first down and, you know, they were in enemy territory. 15 yards, right? And didn't need a lot of yards, right? And, you know, my friend and I, I I was sitting with my friend, I'm like, all right, yeah, all you got to do is just, you know, spike the ball, maybe run a chunk play, go out of bounds. And the Robert Gunn, it can't hurt. You can't, unless, you know, an Alabama-Auburn kicks it <laughs> again. But that that's once-in-a-lifetime type thing. Or and, it gets I mean, blocked. Just, it, that's exactly, the one thing. Like, it, can't, it can't hurt. Like, there's more benefits than, you know, downsides of it. But, you know, as the game went on, you just saw just a lack of, you know, I don't know if it was creativity or just, you know, you can't throw a bubble screen on third and one in overtime when you're down seven points to win a game. And then, you know, you're forced on fourth and one to throw not only a slant pass to Bo Collins, but you completely miss him when, you know, you have guys like Moffa and Shipley who, you know, have been balling all game. They can get, they are the type of guys that, you know, you can get a yard from. Not even that. You could, you know, do what the Philadelphia Eagles do. Just crowd the box, throw Klubnik in. You have guys behind you and, you know, pick up a yard. I mean, it, just so for me, it's just a real. I mean, the game's just a head scratcher. If you know, you know, yeah. you put it into perspective. Um, whether if it was like a lack of attention to the game, lack of timeouts, but you know, you had to tell you know three quarters in that the game was going to go down to the wire. Yeah. So yeah. using those timeouts in bad times, it just shows you know like a lack of attention to the game, in my honest opinion. Yeah, I mean, Dabo said in one of his press conferences that. Uh, he only had one regret. He, he loved the way the game was called. He thought they did a great job, but he said he had one regret, and it was giving Keg Klubnik the option to throw a bubble screen and because that was an RPO. And why Cade pulled that ball just blows my mind. And, and literally, even though he threw that bubble screen, like I'm still under the impression that Adam Randall is huge. Like He should get one yard. I don't care. Like, fall forward, for God's sakes. And, I mean, you're one yard away. Like, I know the guy's at your feet, but do something. Don't just fall down. And and then then that that slant, I don't know what happened on that. Like, that slant to Bo Collins, he didn't even give Bo Collins a chance. Like, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, well, let's go back to the play call on third and one. And look, it was third and less than one. The uh, the ball right. it was six probably inches, closer man. to third and six inches was probably yeah. what it was closer to. I was watching on TV, and you could see where the ball was in relation to the yellow line, the line the game, and it was very clearly less than a yard. So, obvious, obviously, conventional wisdom says you just line up and you run it down their throats. And by the time the fourth quarter had gotten underway, Shipley and Mavo, I mean, they were gashing the Florida State defense. Yeah. They were not going yeah. to stop either one from getting six inches, probably not going to stop them from getting six yards. And so my fundamental yeah. problem with that play call, yes, it's an RPO. Yes, they expected Klubnik to keep the ball, but don't give him the option. Too yeah. many things can happen in that situation when you start asking people to start thinking. Just don't give him the option. Tell him this yeah. is a handle. You're going to put the ball into the chest of Shipley or Moffa. They're going to get six inches. We're going to reset the downs, and we're going to score and get this game to a second overtime. 
And, and yeah. once you gave him that option, then there were just too many things that could go wrong. Yep. Yeah, right, it, but it was bad. And I think especially, you know, one of the brighter spots, regardless, you know, of the of the fourth quarter and the overtime, how it ended was Clemson moved the ball very, very well. They had 25 first downs compared to the Seminoles, 16. You know, I – it felt very – I felt a lot of comfort from this game because there were third downs that, you know, in the previous three games, I'm like, okay, they're not going to convert, punt it over, <laughs> possession's done. And whether if it was Cade with the ball, Shipley, Mafa, or any of the receivers, they're moving the chains. And, you know, it, yeah. it came a lot to it. Uh, you know, talk about the Phil Mafa 46-yard chunk play before, you know, the fumble and all that. But it just makes you scratch your head, especially with, you know, you have two downs to get six inches and you have the one of the best running back duos in the country. So well, that, my that's, thing is that's why, the main thing. Yeah, my thing is why – did you even throw it on fourth down? Why not run it? Why not give Same it to them? Yeah, like just run it or or quarterback sneak up the middle. Like why even <clears throat> throw it on fourth down? And right. um, you know the one the I think one bright spot that I think a lot of people are happy about is um, Stellato. Like he had a magnificent day, and. Um, I mean, I like Dabo said, he never expected him to be available. And then he comes out like he didn't he didn't even have the brace on. Um so I don't know. That's one of the bright spots. Just I know we're talking about all the <laughs> negatives, but just thought I'd throw a little bright spot in there. Well, oh, before funny. We, I said before we move on and talk about the Syracuse game, because this is another big game coming up this week, let's talk a little bit about the positives from Saturday. And again, there were probably more positives than there were negatives. It's just the negatives are going to be what people remember, what people are going to harp on. For the simple fact of the matter is, it was a game that Clemson dominated everywhere but the scoreboard. It was a game that Clemson should have won. I think Clemson was the better team on Saturday. I think the numbers back that up. I don't think that's conjecture. I don't think that's any type of homerism. I think the numbers statistically, irrefutably, and tangibly back that up. But the fact is, the Tigers lost. Doesn't mean that there weren't good things to take away from it. And uh, two things to me that stood out, Cade Klubnick finally looked comfortable. He looked like a savvy veteran. He stayed in the pocket. He he picked up reads. He picked up blitzes uh, and, and delivered some great throws. One that comes to mind in particular, he threw the ball as he was hit. But he stared down a pass rush took the hit, released the ball simultaneously with getting hit, and found Jake Brinning still right over the middle to the one-yard line. And that led yeah. – Clemson scored on the next play. To me, that's just a tough play. That's, that's a kid that's grown up, and, and he made a tough play. And then you're starting to see the vertical passing game come into play. Tyler Brown. Yes, I'm I was about out. to mention that. I love that kid. I love what he brings to the table. Troy Stilato, Clifton, as you mentioned – and you've got other guys, Bo Collins, getting to the middle of the field. Brenning Stool, I think this was probably the most tight end involvement we've seen in a game this year. He had a great mm -hmm. afternoon. So you're seeing these things beginning to flash, and you're optimistic, and you can take some positives away from this. But given the fact you're two and two now, you're zero and two in the ACC, despite all of the positives. But if you do, but if you subscribe to the notion you're building on this then how do you take the positives and move on from here? Where does Clemson go from here? I think the biggest thing um, that I took away, um, besides the defense, and I'll get to that in a bit, is, you know, like you said, how comfortable Cade was. And I knew this was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. And I think, you know, Clemson fans were a little bit impatient because if you look at all the ACC quarterbacks, right, Jordan, I'll take Jordan Travis, for example. He's 23 years old. He's a fifth-year, you know, he has plenty of time to, and he's had plenty of time to just gain experience. Uh, you can say the same thing, you know, about Riley Leonard in week one. You can say the same thing, you know, just to point out a couple of Garrett Schrader in this week. And, you know, we'll get to him in a little bit. But, you know, what I liked about Kate is that you're going to have a, a lot of more games where he's going to feel this comfortable. And I think you're going to see, you know, a lot more of that on Saturday. But, you know, I think another big thing to take away was the defense. And, you know, you're putting oh, one, God, of the, yeah. one, of the, one of the best high-powered offenses – and you only held them to 17 points pretty much, you know, regardless of the overtime touchdown. 
you held one of the best receiving duos in Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman. They had 20 targets altogether, and they had 10 catches. Jordan Travis had 16 yeah. incompletions to his 21 completions. So I just, you know, I think you're finally starting to see the defense click. And the, the, I think the Clemson defense is elite, right? They have tons of guys across the board. Xavier Thomas got, got up there. You know, the, the linebacker trio was just as good. And if you get Nate Wiggins back, you know, I don't think this Syracuse team will be able to pass against this Clemson secondary. I, you know, and it's a complete, it's a complete mirror compared to, you know, last year giving away all the big plays compared to now you're not yeah. even allowing big plays to guys like Wilson and Coleman. I uh, So, I mean, I'm very optimistic about this team. You know, maybe not for this year, but maybe more of next year. But I think you're going to see a lot more flashes of how this Clemson team can play in the future. That will be a lot more com- comforting for Clemson fans. And Clifton, I think Griffin just hit the nail right on the head. And, and yeah, <laughs> it sucks right now. Let's not lie or kid or lie mm-hmm. to ourselves or kid ourselves. It sucks right now. It's painful. Especially Absolutely. after two consecutive seasons of saying, well, wait till next year. We're going to right the ship. It's going to be better. And then you start two and two. And the two losses are in both in games that you feel like you should have or could have won. But Griffin yeah. makes a great point. I think you did see some things on Saturday that do lead you to believe that uh, could be trending in the right direction, even uh, if you're not going to contend for an ACC championship this year. And that's the simple fact of the matter. You're 0 and 2 in ACC play. Now you're, you're, you're behind the eight ball of Florida State. They've beaten you head-to-head. Duke's beaten you head-to-head. They're still both two, two undefeated teams in this conference. You're probably not going to climb back in it and make it to the ACC championship game. But if you're building toward next year, I do think there's a lot there to be excited about, and perhaps that, um, that trend is going in the right direction in that regard. Yeah, and I'm on the totally opposite spectrum than you are about not being out of it. I don't think we're out of it. And I know that sounds crazy, but um, and that I see that smile, I see that smile. But um, I mean, I still think Duke's going to lose two or three, at least two or three games. I mean, there's a couple. Of, there's a you look down that schedule. I know we're zero and two, but um, I still have a lot of optimism, and I think we can. I think we can beat Miami, um, and we, you know, if we lose the if we lose to Notre Dame, so what? It doesn't. It, I don't care about the national title right now. I really don't. I just want to win the ACC. Like, um, and I don't really care if we lose to Notre Dame. I want to beat them, but, you know, it's not going to hurt our ACC record at all. So, I mean, I still think there's a chance. But on the other side, if we're looking towards next year, we only lose one player on offense. And uh, and that defense is um, going to be elite. We're going to lose a couple people on defense. But that Absolutely. second string, yeah, that second string is um, elite too. Uh, and, you know, they're just getting better. And mm-hmm. they're getting reps. Um, t- you got T.J. Parker. I mean, dang. That's a that's a dude. Big Burley who's out for the season with yeah. injury, presumably. Yeah. If he's yeah. healthy. Stephon Green. I mean, you've got Peter Woods. Uh, you, you've got yeah, guys yeah. that are going to be <laughs> a year older and more mature. Uh, you yep. couple that, and you're right, Clifton, you couple that with an offense that at least on paper should be really, really good by that point. Yeah. yeah you know, I don't see any reason why uh, uh, Clemson couldn't get right back into the mix in terms of title contention. And, look, the playoffs expand to 12 teams. So, you know, you've got a bit more margin for error. Let's not forget about that. Yeah. Yeah, there has been a um, there has been a team to make it to the ACC championship with two losses. Remember that, you know, it's going to take a lot. But I know I get it, bro. I'm the total optimist, I'll play and yeah, I'm the total optimist when it comes to that. But I was talking with Anthony, and we're we were kind of looking at the schedule and stuff like that, and you know. I think Louisville's gonna beat. I think Louisville's gonna beat Duke, you know. And there's a. I just. I don't know, man. There's there's a lot of optimism out there, and I'm I'm one of those people. So, um, but you know, if we're looking towards next year, next year's bright. Well, Cliff, I, I, t- I tell you what. If we make it to the ACC championship game and we win it, then you and I are flying out to Las Vegas. We're just going to walk into Caesars, throw our money down, and uh, we'll see how rich we can get before we get on the plane. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, that sounds good to me. Jump on the plane uh, at, at McCarran International Airport, fly back to South Carolina because at that yeah. point, you've been playing with house money anyway. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. I I just think they're. You know, don't get me wrong. I think Clemson could run the table, but I think at this point you are rely. I think there's what five or six undefeated teams in the ACC. It I it could happen. It could happen, and I hope it does. But it's like, but you nobody, have to rely. On, you just have ahead. to rely on. You're relying on too many teams to lose. Oh and yeah, don't exactly. get me wrong. You could you could throw Syracuse a loss. You could throw Miami a loss in Miami. I'm sure that will shake them up. Same thing with North Carolina, but. You're gonna, there's going to be a, need a lot to happen that frankly Clemson can't control, and you know if that mm-hmm. happens, it happens. If they make the if they make the championship, they make the championship. Hey, maybe get some revenge against the Seminoles, but it's I, just I want it so bad, man. <laughs> oh, oh, me too, one hundred percent. But you you need a lot to happen. Could it happen? Absolutely, but you know I wouldn't be surprised if Clemson do not make the championship game. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, you know, guys, it has to start somewhere, and somewhere is Syracuse, New York, this week. So, let's talk a little bit about this matchup with the Orange. And traditionally, Clemson has had all manner of trouble with Syracuse for whatever reason. Even when the talent discrepancy is not even in the same celestial plane as the Clemson Tigers. Syracuse always finds a way to give Clemson all they want. And if you go back to 2017, uh, weird and wacky Friday night game. Clemson goes up to the Carrier Dome. They get uh, Kelly Bryant hurt. Zarek Cooper comes in. We all remember how that went. And Syracuse beats Clemson. Still want to make it to the playoff. But uh, what is it about this Syracuse program that just seems to be a burr in the backside of the Clemson Tigers? I just think they're different, and it's it's weird, right? You have to travel to upstate New York, and I've been there. I toured Syracuse. It's a tough place to be, and especially, you know, you're in a dome, too. It is loud. You're not used to that. I mean, here in Death Valley, it's 70 degrees. Up there, it's almost snowing, and I mean, you could say the same thing. I mean, these players want to be Clemson, too, and, you know, I, I know we wrote an article on our site where Garrett Trader just – he he want he wants to be Clemson and you know he's been through wins he's been through losses and you know it's all at the end of the day it's about heart and you know this team wants to shock the world they want to be Clemson and you know do they have the chance to do it oh absolutely they're at their own they're at their own home base but you know you might be messing with you might be playing with fire you know if you if you're if you think you could be Clemson this weekend that's all I'm going to say about that I tend to agree yeah yeah. yeah, I think I think Clemson's hungry and they're looking better each game. And uh um it's gonna be it's gonna be a fight. But I think Clemson can uh can get it done. Yeah, and we talk you mentioned Griffin, Garrett Schrader, the Syracuse mm-hmm. quarterback. Again, another one of these quarterbacks that has been around seemingly uh forever. And he's experienced. He's a big guy. I believe 6'5", 230-ish pounds. He's a tough guy to bring down. And when you look at the stat sheet, when you look at the numbers for Syracuse, and I've got them right here, Garrett Schrader, actually 350 rushing yards. He leads the Orange in rushing. He also is tied for the team lead in rushing touchdowns. Looking at his passing number, he see he hasn't passed for a thousand yards, uh, nine hundred seventy-two yards, eighty or seventy-two completions, and one hundred and eight attempts. And so he can have some success through the air, but he's also a quarterback that is not shy about tucking it and running it. But with that said, the next leading rusher, the, the primary running back for the Orange, and that's LaQuint Allen, only has three hundred twenty yards rushing. And it just comes across to me as Syracuse is not that prolific of a rushing offense, which if that's true, we saw what Clemson did to Florida State holding the Seminoles to 22 rushing yards. That would mean that Syracuse would have to beat Clemson through the air. That's a pretty tough proposition for them as well. Right. And I think the biggest, I, you know, the biggest thing when you look at Syracuse and who they've played, their best team that they've played is Purdue, in my opinion. And they're a one in, and they're a team that's at the bottom of the Big Ten. So I, it's very tough to do an eye test with Syracuse because Garrett Trader has a game where he ran for 150 yards and two and four touchdowns. Yeah, 195 yards and four touchdowns. That was against Purdue. But then again, you, it's it's very tough to do an eye test comparing, you know, a team like Florida State to a team like Purdue. It's it's very tough. So 
you know, I like you said, Garrett, I don't think they beat them through the air, especially what you saw with Travis um, with Travis against Clemson this weekend or this past weekend. But, you know, Syracuse always brings a fight. That's that's all I will say to that. But I don't think that it will be enough. I think Clemson either eliminate his rushing ability or his passing ability or maybe even a little bit of both. And, you know, they get to him. <laughs> And Cliff, when you compare the two quarterbacks, uh, it, it, to me on paper, having watched Garrett Schrader, having watched Cade Klubnick, Cade Klubnick, of course, came into the game last year at Death Valley against Syracuse, and uh, he pulled that game out of the fire after it had already been doused with gasoline and the match had been lit. And he is just a more dynamic player to me than uh, Garrett Schrader is. He's a faster runner. Uh, to me, he, he's got more upside in the passing game and probably more weapons around him than Schrader does. And that's not to disparage the Syracuse receivers. They've got three good ones in Damian Alford, Donovan Brown, and Amari Hatcher. But I just see the Clemson offense being more dynamic. I see Cade Klumnick being the more dynamic quarterback. So what's your take on that and the quarterback comparison? Yeah, so I think the I think the offense, the Clemson offense, came into their own this weekend, and um, and K kind of got its footing and is kind of learning, like um, getting better. And uh, I know Garrett Schrader is a is a great quarterback, and he's got legs and he can move. And um, but um, you know, I think I think Clemson's got it, and. Uh, um, you know, there have been some of those games where they where they beat us in the pass, and you know, there's been some that they beat us in the run. But um, I think Clemson makes them one one dimensional, and we take away either the pass or the run, and uh, we end up dominating like we did a couple of years ago. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Uh, I think you just you have, and I hesitate to say it. I don't. I I cannot. Cannot take this game for granted. I've seen too many close games uh, between Clemson and Syracuse that were just wild and wacky and every conceivable thing uh, that could have possibly happened that to go wrong has gone wrong, and Clemson has to eke it out late. So I'm not taking this game for granted. But conversely, I do think there's just too much talent across the board. I think Clemson probably is – at least I would hope they're pissed off coming into this week. And, uh, you know, I think there's something to be said for having a bad taste in your mouth. You want to do anything you can to get it out. And right now, the only remedy for that ailment is just to beat the ever-loving snot out of Syracuse. And a big part of me expects it to happen. I, I think the same. The only way I could see this game being turned upside down is, once again, the story of the season, miscues. I think, you know, if you miss a field goal in the first quarter, you throw a pick, you have a bad, bad play. You can't get this crowd going. That's that's kind of the name of the game. You can't get a crowd going. It's it's a noon primetime game on ABC. You you can't do that. You did that against Duke, and you got the crowd going, and it got in your head, and they pulled away in the second half. So I don't think that will happen, mostly because you're going away from a game that you lost to against Florida State, one of the best teams in the country, in my opinion. Meanwhile, Syracuse is a team where they haven't really played anybody that has proved themselves. So I think, you know, it's just – it's 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 kind of a way where, you know, Clemson – not Clemson. Syracuse are on the down, Clemson are on the up because they just played better teams and have a better resume as of right now, just based off the eye test. Yeah, and, and to me, I think it's the Syracuse passing game and Clemson's ability to defend it. And we touched on that. Uh, the Clemson secondary before the Nate Wiggins injury was phenomenal against Florida State, particularly Wiggins. He was guarding Keon Coleman. Coleman, uh, before the aforementioned touchdown in overtime, really had been almost non-existent in the Florida State offense up until that point. Nate Wiggins has just become the leader of that back end. He's matured so much, really. The turning point, I think, for him came in the Wake Forest game last year, and then we've just seen him steadily get better and better ever since. But I just don't have any confidence in Syracuse's ability to run the football so if they can't pass the ball either, then I just don't see any way that they can put a lot of points on the board. Now, a lot of that is predicated on the health of the Clemson secondary. Clemson did get good news on Nate Wiggins because I know I can speak for sitting there and watching it on TV. When he went down, he gets up, he cannot put in. He, the, the leg is just dangling in midair. And my first thought was, oh, dear God, he's blown a knee. 
That's the last we've seen of Nate Wiggins this year. Well, the MRI comes back, and it was more or less a contusion. Uh, no, nothing was torn. Nothing was broken. It was a contusion. He's day-to-day. Don't know if he'll be back this week, but certainly if he is, I think that gives Clemson the edge in, uh, with the defensive secondary against the Syracuse passing game. And I think it gives right. Jaden Lucas some extra, some extra practice, some extra game practice. I guess is what you call it. Right, and um, you know, for me, just I uh, kind of just hop on the X factors. I'm gonna go with just the defensive line. I mean, it's pretty simple. Mm-hmm. I think you know, my mine is Peter Woods, Peter Woods, and T.J. Parker. Um, you know, the usual suspects, but. You know, I think, you know, if Clemson get to the run game early, they prevent first downs, they prevent the chunk plays that, you know, didn't really happen against Florida State, um, and they just carry it over. I think you're looking at a game where, you know, Clemson can get away early and just run away with it and not have, you know, the Syracuse the Syracuse curse, I'd like to call it, that they just always keep the game close or they get upset. I, you know, if you eliminate this run game, and I don't, th- I don't have faith in Garrett Schrader in the passing game, you're going to be completely smooth sailing as long as the offense carries its weight. And, you know, if, if it's the offense that we know and love from last week, it will most likely do so. Yeah, my X factor, I think I've got two on offense. <laughs> One is I think um, Troy Stilato is an X factor and because um, he's coming along and being being good, getting some touches. Um, and another X factor is going to be the turnover margin. Can we win the turnover margin? <laughs> Um, yep. If we win the turnover margin, we win the game. If we are even with the turnover margin, we win the game. So, um, Troy Stilato and turnovers are my two X factors, I guess. Because I'm, I'm like you. I think we take away either the pass or the run and from um, Syracuse, and then we just dominate. So. Yeah, agree on all accounts, fellas. Well, we won't have to wait too very long to get the answer on Saturday. As uh, so, uh, Dabo Swinney likes to say, get up, pour the cup of coffee, uh, get the caffeine in your system, and get ready for the early start. 12 noon from the Carrier Dome in, at uh, Syracuse University, upstate New York. But I'm sure Clemson fans will be all tuned in. They're ready to see a win. I know I am. I'm sure you guys are, too. So we'll see how things play out on Saturday, and hopefully when we come back next uh, Wednesday – For the next episode of Around the Pole, we're talking about a Clemson victory. That's going to do it for us tonight. Before we sign off, just want to remind everybody, check us out at ClemsonSportsMedia.com. You can follow us on X, formerly Twitter. I still call it Twitter, probably always will, at CU Sports Media. And then you can find us on YouTube, Clemson Sports Media. Give us a like and subscribe. We've always got new videos up. Our uh, The Around the Pole podcast episodes will be there. And we've also got Chalk Talk as well, uh, where Dustin breaks down uh, the offensive and defensive schemes and plays and just a lot of great stuff all over our uh, three social media platforms. So check us out. We appreciate you always watching. But until next time, I'm Garrett Mitchell, Griffin Barfield, and Clifton Kennedy for the Around the Paul crew. As always, go Tigers. Go Go Tigers. Tigers.